start the recording. And let's see, make sure it is doing so. Okay, so we are recording. I will turn it over to Meghna to introduce the presenters. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the last event of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Tonight, we're gonna to have a fireside chat with Giselle Santos Rivera and Leanne Jones. Uh, Leanne has graciously agreed to conduct the chat. Let me briefly introduce our guest and our host. Leanne Jones is a principal at DLR Group. Uh, she works from their LA office, but before that, she was a part of AI Orange County's Women in Architecture Committee. Uh, she was an active member actually, and I really miss her. Uh, Giselle, there is a lot of things to uh, tell about Giselle, but I'm gonna keep it short. Uh, she's an architect and a vice president at HKS Washington, DC. She's the associate representative on AI National Board and board secretary at AIA DC chapter. She is a committee member at AIA's Equity and Future of Architecture, the New Urban Agenda Task Force, AIA COVID-19 Health Impact Task Force. She is a co-founder of the Latin American Interior Designers, Engineers, and Architects DC Committee. She is also the founder of WIELD, Women Inspiring Emerging Leaders in Design. WIELD received the AIA Diversity Program Recognition Award in 2019. She is also a 2015 Christopher Kelly Leadership Development Program Scholar and a recipient of 2018 AIA Associate Award. Welcome, Giselle. Leanne, you can take it from here. Okay, great. Those, thanks, Magana and Giselle. It's great to have you here. Um, just so that everybody knows, what I've done is um, uh, the three of us had kind of a conversation about this program and then I put together a few questions that I sent to Giselle ahead of time so that she would have an idea of kind of the conversation, um, but it's really meant to be um, truly kind of a fireside chat. So please, as was mentioned, use the chat window. We want this to be as much of a dialogue as possible as we can all have in these, in these days of uh, Zoom dialogue happening. So I'm going to just... Um, lead off with the first question that I sent you, Giselle, which was, so I read in a bio for you that you were originally headed down the science path in college and took an art class that headed you down a different path. Can you describe a little bit more about your journey? And was there something that as a child that made you think architecture was where you might wanna end up? Sure, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you, Megan, thank you, Leanne. Uh, thank you everybody that has joined us today. So my path into architecture has been everything but linear, including how I came to the architecture school in Puerto Rico. My parents always knew that I was going to become an architect. I love to destroy the house. I would take all the cushions and all the, the blankets and I, I would love to make my brother spaceships and castles and cities uh, throughout my entire, my entire childhood. And my parents, in their minds, I was always going to become an architect. And I thought I was too, until I met an architect and they showed me a bunch of models. I'm guessing they thought, I'm a young person, I love Legos. They're gonna, they're gonna see the models and they'll, they'll gravitate towards it. The reality is for some reason that made me think, oh, I don't wanna do that for the rest of my life. I do that already. You know, I built things already. And I decided that I was gonna study genetics. I was very intrigued about genetics the construction of the human genome and all of those things. And one of my cousins was working on that. So I took that path on, uh, when, when I started uh, my undergraduate degree, but then I realized I hated working in a lab. The labs in Puerto Rico were block, built, painted white, no windows. And it was something that I, it felt disconnected and you would have to sit all day and, and do this work and take notes, but there was very little human interaction or exposure to the environment. So I started taking courses in geology and, and physics, and I started doing artwork because I, was, I had always done artwork. And it was in one of my installations that my geology professor attended a gallery exhibit. And it was this very crazy voyeurist thing, which I'm not gonna delve into, but he said, I think you should consider architecture. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, yet again, somebody's talking about architecture, but he said, no, you have, you have this mind that thinks about concepts and, and mathemat mathematics and science and you apply it in some form or fashion. I think you should go for the summer program. And I did the summer program and I fell in love with building models. I fell in love with putting things together 
And my geology professor said, see, I, I told you that you would be able to put everything together and create something that was meaningful for society, meaningful for your communities. And that's how I fell in love with sort of architecture. But it has been kind of a crazy ride ever since. I gravitate towards problem solving and also how to give back to the community. And that's how I end up transitioning, I guess, at, at times trying to find my place and my voice within within architecture and the, the the design industry as a whole yeah so that um, that's a it's a really great story I think one of the things that um, is interesting to me about you telling that story is um, your your experience in the lab environment has that when you were in school has I would imagine now has influenced how you design labs and what you think about kind of in your design, because I know you're kind of in the, more on the healthcare side, is that correct? The kind of the work that you do, which had to have been influenced by kind of what your initial experience was in school. Well, yes, absolutely. And I, like I say, my, my story is kind of crazy. I did institutional work. I, I've worked on justice centers. I've worked on a lot of buildings that made me recognize and reflect back on my experience in, in my lab and in the School of, of Science in Puerto Rico, that lack of access to the environment, that lack of connectivity between people and what that meant in the built environment has been a thread through my career. But it wasn't until I recognized that I didn't wanna work on, on projects that I could not have an influence on somebody's well-being on how the built environment affects them and their health, that I didn't recognize why I was struggling so much with that other work. And it was when I was encouraged to take on some healthcare work that I realized that was a language that was being used. Was how do we talk about colors? How do we talk about access to light? How do we talk about agency and access? How do we talk about all of these things through the lens of what we can bring to the table as architects. So I, when I worked on a lab, I actually worked on, as with many other things, so the back of house and the corn shell. So I didn't get to activate the health, um, the spaces that had to do with clinical spaces or the, the spaces that had to do with, with the lab work when I was thinking about labs. And then I transitioned into a higher education and then it was very recently that I joined that, that kind of conversation and I realized that that was already there. We were already talking about why the offices for the principals in charge of the PICs should be inboard because they close the doors. So the people that are working in the laboratories don't have access to the light because they wanna control the work that they're doing, which is understandable. So we started to design little slivers of windows on the doors. And the first thing they do is they cover them up. And then I was, I was in my early twenties thinking, oh my God, I hate working in a lab. I don't wanna do lab work. Instead of thinking, I love to do lab work because I loved the work. I just hated the space. And I hated what people were doing to prevent us from having a healthy conversation about the space. Because what they were thinking about is, oh, I, I can't show my work, the door has to be closed, I don't wanna be interrupted. But how about we flip the conversation and put those spaces inward so that they can have agency and control. And then the people that are working 24 hours a day in a lab, cause they do, then they have access to light. So I, even though I don't work in, in labs right now, well, actually I'm not doing any work right now, I'm doing a thousand percent Jedi work. But when I, when I do that work, that's always in the back of my mind what is the experience of the user? Not only the client, but the future user. What is the experience of the clinician? What is the experience of everybody? And what is the kind of agency that they have in their space and access to, to the space? Um, and so um, how has, um, those are, that's a great conversation. And I think one of the things that I find really important in the conversations we're having now in design is how do you, how have the questions that you're asking of people changed um, in today's environment, because I do think we've we've gotten a lot more cognizant of how much the environments we're in every day shape our experience in ways that we don't we're unaware of. 
um, and need to be more aware of. So have how have you helped? And I would think, you know, in your role now at HKS um, as EDI director that you're helping your colleagues to, to change the way they're having those conversations. Can you speak a little bit about, about that? Uh, sure. And I think it's a really great question. And I think you're absolutely right. I think there's a greater awareness of our, our voice within the space of design and our, and our impact, whether that is because of COVID or the, the tragic murder of George Floyd, or because now there's a conversation around creating the language that allows us to have these conversations. And now it's sort of more ubiquitous around the, around the industry. It is easy, it is significantly easier to bring it up. And I think that is what has changed at least for me and what has changed for what I hear other people is that now I feel I can bring it up and people understand maybe at least we can have a conversation of why that is important. I think there's more access to resources. I think resources are more available. Um, I think the conversation, particularly because of COVID of the disproportionate access to, to services, to healthcare, to housing, that's been more evident because it's part of social media. It's part of everything now. So it doesn't exist in a vacuum. And for a lot of us that were working, it's in healthcare or in labs or in Jedi. Now we can go back and talk about social media and talk about the world that we are all experiencing and have a language to bridge through that conversation. And people are more willing to acknowledge that we all experience things differently, that we all have different kinds of agency and when we talk about equity, more than not, people don't automatically think, oh, the Me Too movement. I'm like, no, we're talking about access. We're talking about frameworks. We're talking about opportunity and agency. So now I think what has changed is now we have more language to talk about these things and it's becoming part of the social strata. It's not an academic thing. It's not a practitioner thing. It's part of all of our language. So the more that we talk about how we are impacted by these spaces, it, it is has become easier to talk about how potentially a client or a user or a stakeholder may, have, may be impacted by those things because now it's kind of inevitable. Somebody has had an issue about something right. and we can all speak to that. So it's, I think for me, what has been easiest is now now it's easier for me to tell my story and relate it in a way that other people can understand. I think that's great. So, um, so I, you know, and the, the work that you're doing is, um, is obviously really important and it's, you're clearly passionate about it, but it is also groundbreaking. There have not been a lot of people, people that you can look to that have, have, you know, done it before or have started, you know, you're one of the people leading the way. So who have been your mentors along your, along your journey and, and why, who have you looked to for these kinds of, uh, kinds of things? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, and I think, I think there are many levels to that conversation. Um, when I look up, I look at, I look up to Gabrielle Bullock. I look up to Emily Grandstaff Rice. I look up to Renee Chang and Rosa Chang. I look up to people that have been visible and broken. Pascal Sablon, um, a lot of my, my peers at, at NOMA. When I look at my contemporaries, um, I look at people typically that are younger than me that have been farther along in their visibility like Pascal, Jason Pugh and Kimberly. Um, but I, at the very north of everything, I always look up to my mother and I always share the story. My mom is the first woman dean of the School of Dentistry in Puerto Rico. The first woman dean, the first woman president, the first woman to be asked to be part of the advisory group for the Obama administration, the first woman dentist to do that, the first woman to win the guy. So my mom is the first of way too many things. That's why in part I left for the US because it was really hard to follow. And that was <laughs> um, but and what I, what I share with other people is even though my mother has so many accolades, it's, it's like my mother is a dame because she was ordained, um, brought into the house of Alexander the Great. I didn't even know that was a thing. So even though there are so many accolades that could describe my mother when I was growing up, 
I didn't see that. What I saw was a woman that was, as she described it, I'm short, I'm dark skinned, I have a hoarse voice, I'm a woman, people don't take me seriously. She still was able to do all of those things, but what I saw was the frustration and sometimes the disappointment and the pain from her peers and not supporting her, even though she still overcame and did all these things. She still looks back and looks at the things that hindered more of her growth. So as, as a child that is coming up and I see all of these things, um, I think about everything that it took of her to still get to where she is, to still shine, to still be in her mid seventies and working in her private practice and be out there. And it makes me recognize that there's a lot of privilege in having had that experience, a lot of privilege in being where I'm at and being supported by my firm leadership. And when people ask me, particularly younger people that say, oh, I want you to be my mentor. I'm like, oh, that we're all in this space together. There's no hierarchy here. Um, the first thing I think about is I think of my mother and I think of what happens if I don't do the work. If, if I don't have the opportunity, if, I'm, if I could have a voice, why wouldn't I take that on? So when it is, when it is hard, I look to my mother. When it gets really hard, I, I reach out to Gabrielle and I ask her, how did you do it? I talk to my younger peers and I say, what are, what are you seeing? What are you looking at? What, what, is, what do you wanna see in the future of the profession? Help me figure it out. And how can we do this together? So I, I look at everybody because everybody has a story to tell and everybody has something to contribute. So it changes, but it's everybody. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think that's a great answer. I had, I was interviewed last week in my firm about um, just kind of about what are some of the tick, tips and tricks um, as a business development kind of in the business development realm. And one of the questions I've made it very clear to one of my fellow principals, um, Kari Knowles, that I want to get more involved in NOMA. And he wanted me to talk about why. And I, you know, it's kind of what you said, you know, in, in my, in my opinion, I've grown up with a lot of privilege and a lot of opportunity. I've also grown up with a lot of barriers in front of me as well. But it's my job as somebody who grew up with privilege to make it easier for the next generation and to help the group, the younger folks in Noma, you know, get move some of those barriers out of the way. But in order to do that, I have to understand what their barriers are because they're different than the barriers that I had. So, I mean, I think I think it's great that, you know, that you're that you see this as kind of like you don't have a mentor or a few mentors. You ha and I love the fact that you have them at different levels, kind of above you and below you. Um, Cause I do think that's, and that's very different, I think, than the, I'll say the older generation of architects that, you know, you only had mentors above you. You didn't, there was in theory, nothing to be learned from somebody younger than you. So, um, but that's a, it's very different today. Um, so this next question is about women, women in leadership. And I said, for me, there were very few women, none, at least in my, in my journey, in leadership roles in my career. And I was wondering what your experience has been like and what, how that experience might have shaped your path relative to women in leadership positions. Well, well you talked about your mom, but um, kind of on the, on the professional architecture path. So as many other stories, there were very few women, but the women that were there were very strong and vocal reminded me of my mother. And I, I followed them for a very long time. Wherever they went, I would follow them um, because I could see their passion, I could see their drive, and I wanted to be part of that. But they were few and far in between. And the ones that were there, I would do everything in my power to celebrate them and to elevate them. And that's how, in part, we all happened. But I think the people that have been most critical, and that's why when people say, I don't know my place, I think everybody has a place. The people that have been most critical in my development professionally, whether by happenstance or not, are my first, my first um, project manager. He was a openly gay, white, male, white guy that was always 
he was never, he was always out. He was always proud. He was never super o- overly vocal about the situation, but he was the fir- one of the first people that actually got married here in DC. So he was very visible. And I remember thinking, because for me, that was an issue. Um, I, one of the reasons, not what, well, in part, some of the reasons that made it easier to think that it would be um, an easier path for me in the United States was leaving Puerto Rico because I, I'm a lesbian. And it was hard for me to think about the repercussions of that and my mother being such a public figure and the Puerto Rican culture. So seeing him, there was this whole DC, so it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal, but for me, it was a big deal. Um, he was very open, very vocal. And aside from welcoming me, everybody in the industry was very welcoming to him. So that, that obviously led, uh, made a very big impression on me. And because he was one of my first mentors, I never thought anything of it. I've always had the privilege of being out, being very open, never, never ha- having to worry about somebody's percep- perception of me or my partner or, or the conversation. And in the other, in the other firms, I, I always worked with men. I never worked with, with a lot of women. The reason I'm at HKS is because of Shannon Krause, who's a, a leader in, in, in healthcare. And he was also the one that encouraged me to build Wield. Uh, so typically because more of the relationships and the projects that I've been in have been primarily with men, they have been the ones to push me forward and they have been the ones to say, how can I help? Uh, but in through the AIA and my non-practice side, it has been mainly women. So I've had that balance on both aspects and they've shaped who I am, whether professionally or in practice because of their openness and vulnerability. So that has been, I think at the core of it is they have been very open, very visible, very authentic. And, and very vulnerable and have never unwelcomed a challenging conversation with me, which are not so few and far in between. Yeah, <laughs> that probably doesn't have anything to do with your, well, I'm guessing the, um, the conversations in your upbringing were probably pretty lively with some, with some uh, parents that were um, um, high achieving people and then pushing you also to be high achieving. So you don't strike me as one that shies away from a difficult conversation, um, yeah. which is, is necessary. Um, so, I mean, I think one of the things that you and I have in common is that is the, the LGBTQ piece. And I do think in our profession, it's very difficult, I think, uh, especially for women, um, just to, to give a little bit of a story of my, of my past, I spent, two years in my current relationship working at the same firm together and nobody knew because we literally walked in every day and didn't talk about it. And when people found out, they were like, we had no idea. And it's like, right, because that's how we've lived our entire lives of nobody knowing, you know, it was, it was very much a separate thing. Um, How has your, it sounds like your experience has been very different and it's definitely one of my goals to, to make it easier for the generations behind me to not have to go through that um, because it is very difficult and we still are in a profession that it's not, it's not completely accepted. It, you know, we're, you and I are fortunate. We live on the coasts, so it's more accepting, but there are lots of, lots of young people out there where it's not so accepting. Yep. So what, what kind of, um, you know, is one of my questions was, you know, for members of our audience who may work in that bubble, um, what, what advice would you give to them to kind of move, move the conversation forward in a firm around these kinds of issues? I, I think, well, after, after, after almost two years trying to figure this out, I think the, the most important thing is understanding what the conversation is, understanding the language and understanding where you are in that conversation. So there's a lot of self-awareness that needs to take place. There's a lot of other awareness that needs to take place. And that is self-work. That is, that is work that we need to do for ourselves, by ourselves, for other people. And I, I always reference, because it's the clearest, most 
um, succinct practice-based document, I always reference the guides for equitable practice uh, because it is, it is quite robust uh, knowing that none of this has, is fully fleshed out because if it were, we wouldn't be in this situation, but it's a great start. It, it shares with you language. It shares with you opportunities for you and your firm to tackle case studies, um, a lot of resources, even some, um, some samples of work. And it, it starts to let you tackle the pieces as you see the need in your firm. So because it's divided by chapters, um, you can start to tackle each chapter and then try to have a conversation around that chapter and use that as a resource. Like, so I always encourage people to use it as a book report. So, um, and when people ask me, so what can you do? I said, well, a lot of, a lot of firms, particularly now more than ever, they're doing book clubs. How about you start a book club with the equitable guides for practice? Assign everybody a chapter and then distill that chapter amongst that group of that collective that is interested in that. And then pitch something to your leadership. We're reading this chapter and this chapter is tackling this. Are we doing X, Y, Z in our firm? What would this look like in our firm? And start to pick apart the topics in a way that is digestible for you and for them so that you talk about the practice and not just you and how this affects you or doesn't affect you because the reality is when i talk about challenges and opportunities there are many different people in firms um, a lot of people focus on the bottom line on the business case on profit so if you're coming at this through the emotional side it, might, it may not resonate with them for other people, it's about talent and building talent and how you create better teams. So the bottom line is like, yeah, 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 whatever. That's great. Because I know that a good performing, high performing team is going to get me there. So get to know your leaders in the firm, understand where they're coming from and tackle those topics through the guides in a way that meets their expectations and addresses their concerns for your firm. But you know at the core that this is about creating an equitable practice. And I think the best way to do that, at least at, at the start, is to tackle it with the guides for equitable practice. That's, uh, that's really great advice. So on that, um, can you tell us a little bit more about what led you? You told us a little bit about why you headed to HKS, but can you tell us a little bit more about your role at HKS as the EDI director? Sure. So like, like I've said, <laughs> my life was sort of like this thing that happens to me at times. So I, I was involved in the Women's Leadership Summit and because I wanted to amplify the voices of emerging professionals, I created WIELD, um, sort of a parallel of er event that happened after the conference that talked about the emerging professional experience through leadership. And I wanted to show that paths are most likely not linear and that's okay. And because I started becoming visible through, through that framework and creating Wield and, and the events, my firm started to recognize my interest in that topic. So when HKS was going through the strategic planning process and we were talking about our involvement in the UN Global Compact and um, that we wanted to create our environmental social governance structure, we decided or they determined that we needed somebody focused on EDI to be part of that structure so that we could tackle some of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And some of them are um, reduced inequalities and gender equity. Um, so somebody needed to focus on what that would look like in our firm so that we could tackle that SDG and determine what all our SDGs were going to be when we submitted for the UN Global Compact because HKS wanted to um, um, what is it? Partner with people that were interested in the same kind of topics under the sustainability side, on the citizen HKS or purpose driven design or um, pro bono uh, public interest sector work, and how we are doing it internally so that we can do that externally. And all of those things sort of collided when the firm happened to be in DC, the firm leadership happened to be in DC when one of the wheeled events was happening. So when they went back and started strategizing, I think we need somebody in this role, my name came up. 
And because I had all of these things sort of lined up, they asked me if I wanted to tackle that. And it was a hard conversation because I kind of knew what I was getting myself into. Let me rephrase. I thought I knew what I was getting myself into. Um, and I thought I knew it was going to be hard. I didn't think it was going to be this hard, but I knew it was going to be hard. And I knew that it was going to take a lot for me to do 50, 50 work. So that was, that was the conversation. We're going to make this role. We're going to create this role. You're, you're going to help define what this is going to look like. And let's start with 50, 50. And in my mind, I'm like, sure, let's figure this out. This is what it's going to look like. I'll do some medical planning because I could see a thread between medical planning and this work, right? It's about health and well-being and people. And then I started getting into this work and doing this work at an association like the AIA or AIDC is one thing. Tackling this work at a firm that has 1300 employees that, you know, 24 offices across the world is a completely different animal and I was not even at the leadership structure that understood what a leadership structure was. So I had a lot of learning to do and it's been a process of about two years to, for me to even feel comfortable saying, I think I know what this, look like, this, this looks like at HKS with a structure. So what this work has meant is that for me, I wanted to create a structure of accountability first. So this can't just be me. Right? It can't just be one person telling people, I think this is what we need to do. I think this is what needs to happen. So I created a framework called the JEDI framework. And we have about four, four parts. It's the director of EDI or JEDI me, the JEDI council, a group of 12 people that are part of the strategic vision that work alongside me. JEDI champions, the people in the offices, uh, one or two people in each office that lead culture, uh, workplace culture development. So how do you engage with AIA, with NOMA and your community, um, community work, engagement work? Um, how do you celebrate people in the offices and the essential enablers, as I call them? The people that actually do a lot of the work, because it's not me. So talent acquisition, HR, marketing, internal comms, professional development, all of the people that create and refine the firm equity piece, all of the pieces within the firm that allow for, for equity. And that framework then is, is uh, built upon four pillars. And the pillars are firm equity, our framework, our policies, our benefits, all of the things that we do to carry on our message, our stake in the ground. Uh, workplace culture, so all the things that we do in the firm to build a psychologically safe space, to build camaraderie, to build um, high performing teams, to build engagement in communities. Um, the third one is designing for inclusion. So what we do as a deliverable that builds on belonging in, in, in our designs and in our communities. And we use the guides uh, for equitable practice and the framework. So designing for equitable communities and designing for change are two primary pillars on that. And then the fourth pillar is advising for, for belonging. So that, that just means we all understand what we're talking about. So we know who we want to partner with, how we want to partner, why we want to partner, and what kind of impact we want to make in our cities and in our communities. Um, so there are several layers to that conversation. But what I really wanted to do at the onset was create a structure that was accountable for the future of our firm. And that, it, and that meant that many people had to be part of that. And many people had to take responsibility for the outcomes long term. And I know I, I wrote in an article, and I hope this is true someday, that in I hope in 10 years my position doesn't exist because we all do this work. So in part, I was trying to do that really early so that I could get out of it really early. But um, I don't see that happening anytime soon, which is OK. Um, but that's one of, the, one of the most important things is creating that structure and having leadership buy-in into that structure and having the boots on the ground to support that narrative as well. And it sounds great. I mean, I, it sounds like the your firm also was open, obviously open to the conversation because I think that's been, that's certainly been my experience that, you know, you can want to have the conversation, but if, if leadership is not open to having the conversation, it doesn't matter how much you want to have it. It's just not going to happen. 
Um, and it does sound like you're, you're doing it 50, 50, you spend 40 hours a week working on projects and you spend 40 hours a week working on EDI. So right. that's 50, 50, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. right. <laughs> or maybe it's 50 hours on projects and 50 hours on EDI and there's 50 50. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, and I, I will even double down on that, that I, this year has been a particularly difficult year for all of us. And for me, it's been really hard to try and define even my place in this conversation because so much is going on. And I feel like most of it is gender related. Right? It's about our people, it's like it's, it's about our talent and it's about what we're doing with our work and, and our talent. So they, they have doubled down and they have said, we understand that you're 200% on Jedi, that you are not able to work on projects right now because you would be really spreading yourself too thin and it, it wouldn't be fair to a project to do that. And they said, okay, let's figure out how far we can take this because I do want to go back to being able to do projects because this language and, and this work is about project design too. So we, we just need to get to a place where we embody that so that we can do that um, later. So I'm, we'll figure it out how that happens, hopefully 2021. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of interesting. It's not, you know, it's not unlike the sustainability conversation that started however many years ago, where you felt like you had to bring that conversation to the project, but now it's just, it's how we do projects. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're elevating it up, but you know, it, it's just how we do projects. And the reality is we've been, we've been, it, it's going to take longer than a couple of years to, f I'll say, fix this, to change the conversation, because the conversation has been going on a long time in a different way. So we need at least a few years to have the conversation change. Um, so tell us a little bit more about, you've talked about WIELD, but um, we might have some folks that are listening in that might wanna know how they could get involved with that, with that um, organization slash movement. Sure. <laughs> so WIELD, WIELD started off as an event. And it slowly gained momentum and people were very interested in the conversation. And it became sort of a movement and a program. Because it started to get embedded in AIADC, it has formally become a committee of AIADC. So now it's called the Equity Committee by Wield because we wanted to start um, not necessarily stepping away, but being more inclusive in our conversation. So it is not only about women. It is currently by a lot of women, but hopefully it's for everybody. And we're gonna start um, trying to bring more, more diversity to, to the committee split, I guess formally to the committee, but also to the conversation. And we also started doing that in, in our events that happen once or twice a year. In our big event, we had our first um, male, male speaker and it was Gary Hamilton from WSB who is, Gary Hamilton, of course. And he, I love that he brought to the table so many different aspects of the equity piece to the work that he's doing with, with the, the Ghetto Youth Bible, the work that he's doing in Jamaica. So we started quickly changing the narrative to truly be about equity and about building bridges and, and about aligning a value proposition. So right now, we old is the event that we put together and we encourage everybody to, to replicate it um, if they choose to. And I'm happy to take, take um, time to talk about the specifics of the event. But at a high level, the goal of we old is really to amplify the voices of people that are successful in a way that they have defined their success not the stereotypical way of, of, of defining success, although some are in positions that seem stereotypically standard normative architecture, but others are not. Um, for example, we had in one of our first uh, wheeled events, we had uh, Yolanda Cole, who is a principal at Hickok Cole in DC. But one of the things that was most interesting about her story is even though she's a principal at a firm doing 
standard architecture practice, she started studying music. And she, she ended up in, in Australia, like her path is so beautiful and sinuous. But she ended up where we all, in our minds, a lot of us think we should end up. But it was never linear. There are other people like Lee Stringer, who is now a managing partner at EYP in DC, but she was writing books. She was doing workplace. Um, she was not doing formal architecture. And now she's managing an office and leading EDI and leading the conversation about healthy workplace. Uh, so we, we want to bring people into the fold that talk about why you need to study in architecture. So that was the premise. We knew that 32% dropped off. We knew all of these things. And we wanted to find a way to empower emerging professionals to say, my path does not have to be linear. It does not have to be prescriptive. It, I don't need to even know where I want to get to. As long as I'm continually learning and finding a strategy to achieve success. And I define it in whichever way it looks like for me. And we also wanted to amplify the voices of emerging professionals that were doing the great work, that were doing just amazing work, but because they weren't a principal in a firm, they were not being celebrated. So we wanted to pull all those narratives and, we, it, was a, it, and it is a storytelling event. You have 10 minutes to, to share your story in whichever way you choose to. Um, the goal is to inspire uh, women and minorities to stay in the profession because we can't afford to lose any more people. Um, we want the future of our organization, our profession to look like our communities. And if we know that women and minorities leave the profession at a disproportionate time um, and, and incremental, then we need, to, we need to find ways to empower them and inspire them and show them what a successful path could look like. Uh, so now we're trying to do that through a committee so that the committee can empower AIDC as well. So we've partnered with NOMA, La Idea, the Asian American Design Union and the Emerging Architects Committee to do collaborative work. And now we've started to do another event called Our Forum, Our Impact. And it's about what it looks like when committees align in a value proposition and work together. Um, so there are, the wield has many, many levels, but at the onset, it's about keeping people in the profession, keeping them inspired and recognizing that we all define success differently, but it is worth, worth celebrating nonetheless. That's great. I mean, it's a great story. I do think that one of the one of the things I feel like we also need to do as a profession is is um, make uh, youth, middle school kids, mostly middle school, because that's where you need to reach them. Because by the time they get to high school, they may have already figured out what they at least were their path right after high school. Is make them aware. Make more than make all of those minorities aware of the opportunities that there are. Um, in the profession. Um, so there is a question. We have about 15 minutes left. There is a question, sort of. It's kind of long, but so I'm going to read it. As a straight white male, I think the AIA has pushed diversity forward a lot faster, further than most. We are a creative field, which is more open and diverse overall. I attended national as Indianapolis president in 2006, when the challenge was put out by the keynote that we were dead, meaning we were mostly males in their 40s and 50s. Within two years, we had a female national president and national executive director, and classrooms have gone from mostly male to 10 years ago when I taught as adjunct at Ball State, it was 60% female. So what has to change now? Would you like to take that on? Sure. Uh, well, I'll, I'll do a little anecdote. And Oh, there are many ways to answer this question. So I can share, for example, I just, so my, my term with the AIA National Board ended. So I'm, I'm formally not an AIA board um, director anymore, which is fine. <laughs> Everybody needs a break. Uh, but if you look at the composition of the board that I just left and the board that is un incoming, there's a stark difference in the board composition. And we can look at time, 
we can look at a very specific time and look at changes. But when we look at the incremental path of the profession as a whole, and you look at the leadership in most firms and organization, and you look at the percentage of people that leave, not a lot has changed when you look at that. And that is, that is part of the conversation is that if you look at moments in time, it may seem that there is nothing to change, but the reality is there are spikes and there are valleys. And when there is a big spike after the big spike, inevitably, most often, we have big valleys. So what we really want to look at is at the longevity of the profession and the progression in the profession. So if you, if you have a chance to look at the leadership of a lot of the firms, a lot of firms have added women into a lot of boards. How many of those women in leadership roles are architects and not interior designers or marketers or researchers or allied, um, allied professions? How many of those boards are ethnically diverse? And how many of those are gender and ethnically diverse? So we can say, yes, we've made progress. Have we become truly equitable? No. Have we changed the look of the profession? I don't think we have yet. I think we are, I think we've built a narrative and a language that allows us to speak about this significantly better. But I don't see just yet that we've made an incremental change that will allow us to be truly equitable in the next 20 years. And when I say truly equitable, that means that we need to have at least in order for a minority to not feel like a minority, they have to be at least 30% present in a, a group or a board. And I, I haven't seen that yet. I, if you look at the board right now, um, and you can just look up the AIA.org, we have about just four women and two of them I think are ethnically diverse. And we just left the most diverse board that has ever existed in the AIA. Um, so that's, that's what I'm gonna say. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I do think it's it's a difficult conversation. We have to, it's going to take some time, but we need to keep making progress because it, it will make us better. It will make us better as a profession. It will make us better as, a, as an environment if we're being more inclusive and more diverse and having more voices at the table, so. And something really easy to do, uh, look at the demographics of the United States look at the demographic of your city, look at the demographics and the composition of your firm. And if they don't match, we're not where we want to be. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, the, the easiest example that's get used quite a bit is looking at the ethnic diversity of the U S Senate and looking at the ethnic diversity of the U S house of representatives. And something, one of those two needs to change significantly. <laughs> so, I mean, and it's no different, I don't think in our profession. So um, I don't know if anybody, nobody else has put any other, uh, other than one person saying that, uh, I think Eddie said that his firm is using the guide that you referred to, um, which is great. I don't know if anybody else has any other questions that they wanted to put in the chat or if they wanna just, um, speak into their microphone and ask a question. I'm happy to answer questions. Anybody brave enough out there? I, I have some questions. Um, so um, as I embarked on this uh, equity path, uh, when we all started working from home, uh, basically I was really frustrated and I couldn't get anything done. And my mind was just spinning on how I can fix things. Um, started to develop kind of some concepts and some ideas on how to not just talk about equity, diversity, inclusion to people who don't necessarily understand what that means, but starting to use design language to help align different perspectives to help form consensus 
and then disguising that as equity work when they don't know that I'm trying to do it. Um, started talking to you know some of the senior leadership. They started to kind of understand what I was doing. Uh, showed a lot of interest. That's when they brought me onto the board for for EDI. Um, but I'm still struggling to get that design language concept to really really gain traction because we're all so so isolated at the at the moment. Is there is there any way that you might be able to suggest to help kind of create some some steam about creativity and EDI work in in you know in collaboration? Ooh, that's a good one. Okay. Uh, and let me see, I'm, I, I'm, I'm listening to that and I, I have my bias and I carry my baggage. So I'm, inter I'm gonna interpret the conversation through the lens of something that, I'm, uh, that I've been working on and, and trying to delve into. So on the design side, are you, are you talking about sort of designing for equitable communities, designing for belonging? I'm designing and everything, welcome. so I'm designing uh, even the relationships. So designing the relationships, the designing communication, helping to, so you, you actually, I'm, I'm also a, in science and tech, I, do, I design labs. And typically when you design a lab, you give you know, the, the, the uh, researchers a checklist, what do you need, what do you do? You know, and it goes into a black box and it comes out, this is what the architect designed. I don't wanna do that. I want to actually have real conversations and um, invest in the experiences that they have uh, so that I can start to extract pertinent information that isn't necessarily communicated on a spreadsheet. By doing that, that encourages conversation for my team, people that I'm collaborating with such as consultants. And also there's a marketing aspect to it because you are actually bringing a humanity to that concept, to that design. So when I slow down and talk about it that way, I, I think there's, you can see the value in it, but when I get so excited and I'm trying to pitch it to somebody who I'm working with, I can't necessarily um, create that excitement and create that linear path so that they understand where I'm going. Uh, and I guess what I'm, what I'm asking is, uh, um, how long did it take for you to become comfortable to start conveying your ideas and concepts so that people understood you? Well, I don't know if they understand me still. Um, I think that's a process. And what I'm, well, I think there, I, you think you, I think you've shared it really beautifully. There are many levels to the conversation and there are many, there are many ways to tackle or approach the issue of how to build, how to get the best out of people that you're working with and how to get best, the best out of the users and the stakeholders, how to get at the root of the conversation. And I think a lot of the a lot of the best ways to do it are through community engagement techniques, and I'm starting to delve into that because that was not part of my my toolkit. I I approach a lot of these things through the through the medical planning phase and user group meetings. So how do you create active engaged user group meetings? How do you um, use the A threes and the lean practices? How do you create avatars to have conversations? So those those toolkits are are readily available. I can share those with you. When I when I'm interested in equitable communities and in at the root of the equitable community. So how do you talk about healthy communities, walkable communities, community engagement? How do you talk about all of the things that are not specific to the user, but the big picture of the scope of the work? Like how this building and the people that interact with it. Um, affect the community and the health and wellness of the community long term. That toolkit I, right now is lacking in the in the AIA framework for excellence measures. So I thought that's where you were kind of going. And there there's a task force, the new urban agenda is tackling that. They just put out an RFP to get an, 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 an academic institution and an architecture firm and an, a 501c3 to partner to start digging into what that toolkit as a designer needs to be so that we can go to the table and go, this is not necessarily a checklist, but these are all the things that an architect can do to build equity in your community. And a lot of that is rooted in a lot of us not understanding our scope either. And a lot of people saying, well, that's not the scope of the architect. I don't bring in the money. I don't work in policy. I don't do any of those things. So that's not my lane. 
I'm here to just do what the client tells me to do. And if they don't care about that, then they don't care about that. So what are the, what are the tools that we need in order to be able to have that conversation? Those are, I think those are being developed. If, they're, if the tools are, how do we create avatars? How do we create engagement? Like user, like uh, user group meetings or stakeholder engagement? The tools that I use are uh, from the Lean Construction Institute and the Lean Six Sigma. Um, and I kind of distill those, but I think one of the ones that is that has been fun and helpful is breaking up the teams. So breaking up the teams, putting a, a designer, a lab planner, um, a user, um, a client, putting them in a, in a group, creating an avatar for them and forcing them to have to think about the other. Whether they resemble the other where other people do, having that conversation around a strategy and then coming back to the group. And then when people start talking about, well, my person is a woman that has children, that's such and such, all of a sudden you start seeing the things come together because they're forced to think differently. So if there are tools like that, yeah, we can have conversation. I can bring people in that are well-versed in this too. Um, but I think holding up a mirror and having people look at themselves and look at the other when this is not something that people do on a regular basis can be really helpful, but it's a little subversive. Um, and we can, I guess we can all use a little subversion sometimes, but that's part of one of the strategies that we've used. And that's not unlike, I know in lab work and healthcare, we do that. So it's more about being intentional and embedding that early on in the stakeholder engagement process. Interesting. I like. I love the idea of the avatar as you know, as a different a different individual because it's developing empathy for what somebody else what somebody else is going through. So, and using and using good language to describe them. Yeah, there's right. a there's a really powerful video out there that you might have seen this. The Cleveland Clinic did it, um, and it shows it's a video about empathy and compassion, and it shows all of these different people visiting their facility. And there's something about each of those individuals. And the one that I remember is like, there's two men going up an escalator and the, the item that comes about, about the one guy is he was just diagnosed with a malignant tumor. And the next guy who looks, you know, just another guy, like just found out he's cancer free. But these are things you wouldn't know about either one of them just by looking at them. And it's that it's, you know, when it's all about developing empathy, so. Um, let's see. So a, a little follow up here, um, creating advancement grants that encourage diversity in the profession we need. Yes, agreed. The Architects Foundation is doing a really good job in, in mobilizing those. So there are several scholarships and grants that are part of the Architects Foundation. And there are also through NOMA, um, there are several grants and several scholarships and funds that can support that. And if um, a lot of HBCUs are starting to create fellowships and encourage fellowships with and partnerships with architecture firms to support a graduate student through the length of their career. If anybody's interested in participating or learning more about these, I'm happy to share um, some of these grants and some of these scholarships that are, that are happening. And I know Crew Commercial Real Estate um, has a lot of them too. Uh, ULI has started this conversation as well. Um, yeah, thank you, um, Thaddeus. For, so for we are at 5.30. I don't know if that, I think this was scheduled to end at 5.30. Is that right? Yeah. Just want to be mindful of Giselle's time. She is on the East Coast and she's probably got, do you, have you been to the grocery <laughs> store to get your um, your milk and toilet paper and chocolate? <laughs> The chocolate were good. The chocolate were good. Uh, no, it's very, very dark. That's the problem. The light, the the light in the room is behind me. So all the glass tends to shine. So yeah, it is as dark out here as it is in here. That's why I have a selfie light in my face. But no, my, my, my wife is out still. So she's in charge of the groceries. Nice. Yeah. Make sure she gets some, uh, a nice bottle of wine or something for the, uh, because you're going to be trapped. You're going to be still trapped at home. <laughs> I, we we're good with the rum, the the gin, 
the cider and and the yeah we we just need actual food <laughs> <laughs> so thankfully we're we're good we're good we're, this has been a great conversation giselle um and the one thing i didn't mention for anybody on the line is giselle and i both went to syracuse university so go orange um as did rosa shang just just saying there must be something about it <laughs> And Stephen Lewis, who was also oh, right. on the West Coast. Oh, yeah. My significant is a diehard Syracuse fan. <laughs> yep. So. <laughs> oh, that was great. <laughs> she, she's also the was the head of the Indiana Speed women's professional football team. So oh, nice. Very yeah, involved nice. with the diverse oh. story. Here, I can put this up. Yeah, oh, there, there we go. go. <laughs> Nice. I don't know what football game this was because we all know Syracuse doesn't have a good football team. So <laughs> not, th not this year. Not for quite a while. So um not I since 2003 when I started. Nice. Yeah, I killed it. I'm sorry. It's my fault. That's okay. <laughs> so Megana, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to to end with or um, no, I just want to say thanks to both of you. It was a great event and hopefully it helped everybody to, you know, start a conversation in their own firms also. We'd love to see some progress, follow up on this action items. Uh, you guys can reach out to me if you have any questions and I'll convey them to Giselle and Leanne. And uh, both of them are pretty active on social media also if you want to find them. Yep. Happy to happy to, to participate. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you all for the great Thank questions you. and thank you for good for night. The yeah. Have happy Stay holidays, everybody. Bye thank now. You. Yeah. <laughs> thank yeah. you, everybody. <laughs>